Hey, what's going on everybody? Gareth here, FCP Euro. Welcome back to another suspension guide. Today we're going to be talking about the suspension on the G2X 2, 3, and 4 series. If you're from the world of BMW, most of this is going to look the same as really any other previous generation, 2, 3, 4 series. Uh, but there are some unique things that have been changing. Uh, of course, BMW evolving these cars over a period of time. Some it's going to look the same, some might look a little bit new. But that said, we're going to look at a G20 330i X-Drive and lift behind us. The only thing that's going to be different is really the front axles. Most of the suspension on these cars ends up being pretty much the same across the board. So that said, we're not really going to be talking too much about the parts around the table. We're going to be doing it all on the car and the lift behind us. So to talk about the suspension, let's start within the engine bay. Front suspension on this car is a McPherson strut, it's a two-link suspension, or Z-link, uh, BMW originally referred to, but um, what I want to talk about specifically in here is this is a G20 330i X-Drive, so entry model car, and if you were to look at, let's say, an M440i, um, you would have an additional strut brace that comes from the cast strut tower all the way down here to the front radiator support. There's also going to be a V-brace in the back of the engine bay, and you'll notice that this car does not have that. But if you wanted to add something like that, the affixing points for the links, both here on the strut tower and also normally here, it's a welded on nut from the factory. You can simply replace the radiator support. You can then add that front strut bracing to this car very easily because those attachment points are there. You even look at something like the air box here where that spacing has been made for that link to go from here to here and then from here to here. So there's a lot of modularity on these cars, a lot of parts swap over. Uh, we'll talk about some of the things that have been done on this car, like for example, certain control arms that have been replaced with alternate options that are going to change the way that the car feels and behaves. That said, I'm gonna lift the vehicle up and we will talk about some of the specifics underneath the chassis and what BMW's changed on this generation of 3 Series from the outgoing F33 Series. So first and foremost, this is an X-Drive car, and uh, the subframe on these X-Drive cars looks like it could be aluminum uh, based on how the subframe looks. It's steel, it's got some kind of galvanized anti-corrosive coating. If the car was real drive, the subframe is just kind of coated black. Maybe I guess they figure that an all-wheel drive car is going to be more exposed to the elements, Therefore, they should do some kind of anti-corrosion coating to prevent the subframe from rotting away, aka 90s, for example. So it is a steel subframe in the front. Doesn't matter if it's rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Now, that said, it is a McPherson strut car. So you have your strut, and the weight of the car is supported by the spring. At the very top of the strut body, you have this very interesting-looking strut mount. It has two of these sort of studs on there. Uh, these are basically the pilots for aligning the strut into the proper location so you can thread the bolts down from the top. The factory strut mounts, at least now, they are threaded. They kind of have a nut at the bottom. Uh, so it does not use self-tapping screws like the F30s would have. Uh, but of course, as these cars age, some of the aftermarket strut mounts come out. These could change, but it's kind of an interesting design. It has an integrated strut bearing. So it's all one piece. So when you buy the strut mount, uh, it's all incorporated as one assembly. Uh, so really the way that this system works, it's pretty simple. Um, you have your wishbone here, which is the straight control arm. This sets the track width of the suspension. Uh, so in terms of like whatever the camber settings are from the factory, that is totally dictated by this control arm right here. This is the thrust arm or traction strut. It's got a bunch of different names you could possibly call it. Uh, but this is responsible for maintaining the caster of the suspension. This is always going to be the largest control arm on this style of suspension, has the biggest bushing. Uh, I want you to think about it this way as you're driving the car straight down the road. All the road forces are trying to push everything that way. So this control arm is responsible for maintaining suspension geometry. Another thing to consider too is as you turn the steering wheel, these control arms are actually designed to pivot in and out like that. So these do have a little bit of deflection side to side. Um, but what's interesting is both of these control arms, regardless of whether it's X-Drive or not X-Drive, there's an M-Sport variant and a standard variant. The inboard bushings are what change. So stiffer rubber, less void, technically better steering response. 
this is an M Sport thrust arm that's on this car. And I still want to show you, there's quite a bit of play with this pry bar. You can actually see the caster angle change here. But as you're driving down the road, you're going to have these movements. Now, the M Sport upgrade is really nice on these cars because it does provide a little bit additional feedback, a little bit more feedback to the steering. Also should stiffen up the steering a little bit, but there is one more thing you can do. We have a video talking about these thrust arm monoballs um, way back in the day, showing you the difference that one of these can make. It is a Teflon lined bearing. BMW uses these on a bunch of different applications on cars. This has been adapted to a housing that could be installed into this thrust arm, and that completely removes this movement that you see here because again i'm not even pushing that that hard and there's quite a bit of movement so that's still a very soft stock bushing and i want you to consider that with a car with a ton of mileage on it 60,000 70,000 80,000 miles these rubber bushings can start to fail and you will get even more play i mean that's quite a significant amount of movement and it's not so much that but it's also the side to side movement too that you start to get in these too so if you're somebody who's looking to improve the performance, maybe remove some of the numbness that some of these G2X cars are known for. This monoball option, this one specifically from Dynan, is a really good option for helping dial in some of the sportiness that you might want from this car. If not, the M Sport upgrade's a nice one, and if you don't care about that at all, you can go ahead and put stock control arms back on the car. But this one is very critical for maintaining suspension geometry, and this bushing right here inboard is the one that's known to fail more often than not. Now, back in the day, BMW used tapered ball joints. So you see this little stud right here. It would basically have a taper. It would sit and insert in the knuckle, and then the bolt would, or the nut would come down, clamp it all together. You would have no movement there. BMW moved away from that design. They now use this sort of conical or almost round seat, which helps locate it at a straight taper. Theoretically, uh, these should not get seized in the knuckle. However, that has been known to happen. In a perfect world, you remove the nut, you can just pop these right out, no problem without any special tools. You do have a situation where some corrosion has happened here. Um, you're gonna have to get creative on removal, but technically no special tools are needed for removing these ball joints when you replace them uh, on these cars. Whether X drive or wheel drive, it makes no difference. This style is the same for both the tie rod, thrust arm, and wishbone. So moving along here, we have our sway bar, which unfortunately goes up over the top of the subframe. And also unfortunately, the sway bar bushing is bonded to the sway bar. So if you have an issue with the sway bar bushing, you're probably going to be replacing the sway bar unless you can find a replacement bushing. Um, sometimes there's polyurethane aftermarket ones. At the time of filming, there is no option for that. Uh, but uh, as these cars get older, you'll start to see some of those solutions. Also shocking, but also not shocking at the same time, the uh, ball joint for the sway bar link is inside of a plastic housing, despite the link itself being metal. So you have this plastic housing that is bonded somehow to the link. These are gonna be a wear item, and I'm sure there will be aftermarket solutions in the future. I can think of like Mila, for example, their HD line, they'll probably make an all metal one. Uh, but this is kind of an interesting design choice. I usually see those on rear sway bar links, not on front sway bars, but, or sway bar links, but that just is what it is. Coming under the car, uh, we have this aluminum reinforcement plate right here. It's bolted to the front subframe. We have this other plate back here. And uh, generally speaking, BMW's had these for a long time, uh, but these are very important to have installed on the front subframe because they do provide structural reinforcement. In this case, this is also acting as a protection plate for the engine and everything else in the engine bay. So make sure that you have these installed because it's both a structural piece and a protection piece. You can even see, looks like Wolverine's been through here. So if in doubt, if it's missing, get it replaced. If you remove it from the car, make sure you put it back on before driving because it is an important part. That said, that's really all there is to talk about the front suspension. Um, again, if you've are from the BMW world. Nothing we talked about here it should be surprising or shocking. Uh, pretty much all the same stuff that you've kind of come to expect off the BMW 3 Series starting from 2006 onward with the E9X chassis. Um, this is basically just a continual evolution of that style suspension, which has been around for close to 30 years at this point.
That said, we're going to move to the rear suspension. There's a lot more going on in the back. Uh, again, an evolution off the F30, but uh, some differences as well. So we'll take a look at the rear and we'll show some interesting stuff back there. Moving to the rear suspension. Uh, this is where it starts to get a little more complicated. Um, we'll call this a continual evolution of what is known as the HA5 rear suspension that started with the E9X3 series. It's a five link rear. Uh, and honestly, if we're really gonna, if we're gonna really, really go back in time, this is essentially an evolution of what Mercedes did with the 190E all the way back in the 80s. Uh, but that said, similar to the F30, your rear shock uh, is bolted to the underside of the chassis so you don't have to disassemble half of the interior to gain access to it. That ended with the E90s and that's probably one of the greatest things that BMW's ever done because if you've ever taken apart the trunk of a BMW to get to the rear shocks, you know that could be a real hassle. Uh, this is a divorced rear setup, so the spring is separate from the shock body. In the case that the shock were to somehow become unattached from the body or the suspension, the vehicle is still going to be supported by the weight of the spring, unlike the front, which is a strut, where that's a load-bearing component. Uh, but one thing that you'll see here, the angle of the spring and how close the shock and the spring are together, uh, I think this is about as close as you can get in a divorced setup from the spring and the shock coming in contact with each other. Uh, if you go back through the generation of 3 Series, like for example the E36 and the E46, the spring is so far inboard from the shock that you have to run a huge spring rate in the rear to compensate for that. Whereas you start to get slightly better spring rate options on these cars and a little bit more of a comfortable ride with some suspension travel in the rear because the spring is very close to the shock body. It's also a pretty large spring as well. So um, there actually is some suspension travel in the rear where your older 3 Series may have been limited on the suspension travel front. So. This is where the G2X generation of 234 series starts to get interesting. You start to have a lot of consolidation of individual parts. So basically control arms become asymmetric instead of symmetrical. Um, we have our tow link and our camber link. The camber link is also the spring seat. These are the same part numbers. The trailing link, which is in the forward location, uh, that is the same part number left and right. The upper forward wishbone, which goes to the forward portion of the subframe, that's the same part number. The only part number that's different is the upper middle control arm, which has the curvature in it. That is different from side to side. So basically four to five control arms are the same, left to right in the rear, which makes ordering very simple because those are individual part numbers that fit both sides. Uh, I will say there's a variation on the spring arm. There's an M Sport version and a non-M Sport version. The only thing that changes is the inboard bushing, which is a little bit firmer for the M Sport bushing, so a little bit less deflection. Uh, but one thing to note is these are all stamped steel control arms in the back. They are fairly small. Uh, obviously, a lot of the suspension loading is being shared amongst multiple links. Uh, but I can tell you for sure that this uh, tow link is going, to be the, is going to be the weak point in the rear suspension. That's by design. If you were to hit a curb or a big pothole or something like that, um, I would expect this arm to be the thing that bends before anything else. And again, that is by design because you'd rather have one weak area in the suspension uh, where the load is being distributed as opposed to it going everywhere. Uh, the tow link that came off this car pretty sure this car struck a curb at some point. Pretty solid. So if you have a hard time aligning the rear toe and subsequently camera on this car I would look at the tow link as being a possible problem. BMW started to do uh, more dual shear connections at the knuckle on this generation of 3 Series. Uh, E9X and the F2X, F3X chassis had a lot of single shear connection points at the knuckle. Uh, BMW's finally started to move away from that. So for example, our tow link here, this is a single shear connection. You have a bolt from the outside that's going into the knuckle. There is nothing supporting this from the outside. You'll see this uh, triangular washer here. That is a safety washer, so in the case that the control arm were to start slipping off the bushing, it can't get past this washer. So if you ever wonder what those are for, that's just a safety in case the control arm were to start slipping. One thing that BMW did really well on the rear suspension of this car is in the forward portion on the subframe, uh, the forward subframe mounts are encapsulated 
and basically locked in place with a giant flat reinforcement piece. So basically the bolt goes to that and then that forward section goes to the chassis. So that prevents the uh, subframe from wanting to twist down under acceleration or under suspension load or drivetrain load. But they've also done that with the rear suspension as well. So you have this plate with the bolt for the subframe going up into uh, the chassis and then it's triangulated to the back of the car. So both the forward and rearward subframe mounts are basically double locked in place, which should prevent any kind of movement of the rear subframe. Even when the bushings start to wear out, that should still keep it locked in place. So that was a really nice improvement to see on this car over the uh, F3X chassis, F2X chassis, which was only that way in the forward location. So one thing to note about this rear suspension, I think it was a mistake that BMW made uh, if you look up the official uh, TIS instructions for replacing the rear upper control arms on this car, they want you to lower the rear subframe. And that's because the head of the bolt for the upper forward control arm, the head of the bolt comes in from this direction. So if you take the nut off and you try to push it back through, it literally butts up against the body of the car. Maybe that makes sense in the case of, let's say the nut gets loose, the bolt can't physically go anywhere. But when it comes to servicing this, you're going to have to lower the exhaust, disconnect the drive shaft, lower the subframe, and then uh, take the bolt out and then put it back through. Uh, we have a DIY in this car where we cut that bolt out and then put the bolt back in uh, going forward towards the body of the car, which is the way that BMW has done that particular control arm location on every three series, starting from the E9X chassis in 2006. So I don't know what the idea was to change that, but that's a serious pain point. It's also a pretty hard bolt, so it takes a lot to, to cut through it. And um, one thing is the tabs on the subframe for those control arms are actually pretty thin, so you wanna make sure that those don't bend when you're playing around with this stuff either. Um, steel subframe, of course, in the rear, kind of come to expect that. Time will tell how these hold up. If they're like any other steel subframe out there, 10, 15 years of exposure in a salty environment, I'm sure they're gonna start rotting from the inside out. So definitely something to keep your eye on as time goes on. And also with this style rear subframe, subframe mounts wear out over time. If you start to feel like a lot of disconnection in the rear of the car, it could just be from the subframe bushings or subframe mounts having developed some play. And uh, you'll feel that when you go over bumps or when you start to accelerate. So you're dropping the subframe at that point to replace them anyway. And if you want my honest opinion, if you have a 10 year old car and you're looking at doing subframe mounts, you might want to consider just replacing the entire subframe as a brand new assembly because by the time you press in the new mounts, buy the tools to do that, buy the mounts themselves, the time it takes, sometimes it's easier just to swap everything over to a new subframe. So just keep that in mind if you happen to be in that position with a higher mileage car. Sometimes that is the path of least resistance. Uh, but past that, again, if you've had a BMW 3 Series in the last, Jesus, I don't know, where are we? 15 years, no more than that, 15, 16, let me do the math on it, 19 years. Starting with the E9X uh, 3 Series in 2006, a lot of this is gonna look very familiar. It's very much the same architecture, just slight improvements over the outgoing version. So, you know, from E9X to F3X, all the way up here to the G2X, all this looks very similar, very familiar. It's just a constant evolution of the same car and a different chassis, but uh, the tie downs that BMW did with the rear subframe, tying both the rearward mounts and forward mounts to the chassis to reduce that movement, uh, I think is a big one. And honestly, I look at stuff like this and I go, can we do that on some of the older generation cars if we were to come up with a solution for that? But past that, hope you learned something. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment box below. If you like this video, of course, hit the like button. And of course, you'll want to subscribe if you own one of these G2X 2, 3, 4 series chassis cars because we have a lot of content on the way. As always, we'll see you for the next one. Thanks for watching.